Hello everyone, welcome to episode 16 of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Today's guest is Ollie Richards. Ollie is an entrepreneur, publisher and language specialist from the UK. He runs a website about language learning called IWillTeachYouALanguage.com. It reaches millions of people annually. Ali has published 20, over 20 books with language publisher Teach Yourself and dozens more with his own publishing house, Ali Richards Publishing. In addition to teaching languages, Ollie enjoys mentoring other online business owners, running conferences, masterminds, and virtual summits under the Creator Smarts brand. Hey everyone, buckle up for a new episode of the EFL Magazine Business Podcast, the one and only podcast made to help you launch your business or take your existing business to a level of success you could never have imagined. Whether you're a school owner, freelancer, publisher, or other entrepreneur, you're sure to pick up lots of actionable advice when you listen to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast. Remember to visit EFLmagazine.com for great articles and features. Without further ado, here's your host, the founder of EFL Magazine, Philip Pound. Uh, welcome back, everybody. It's my great pleasure to introduce Ollie Richards to you today. And uh, good afternoon where you are. Is it, I presume, Ollie, where are you at the moment? It's actually morning. Um, it's oh. half, past ten, half past 10 in the morning. I've got a beautiful morning sun uh, shining across the Devon, Devon Hillands here in the southwest of England. And um, so probably quite different to, to, <laughs> to where you are with the Tokyo Tower in the background. Um, but good to talk to you. Yeah, good, good uh, great, great to catch up. Um, we've been kind of going back and forth over the the past few months, and uh, just to say, I'm I'm not a, I don't actually live near Tokyo Tower. It's all kind of fake news. This backdrop no. <laughs> you might see for those people who you know it's it's a podcast, so we're, we're not putting it on video. But um, yeah, I have a, a, a background of uh, Tokyo Tower. So, what took you to Devon? Are you are you from Devon originally? No, not at all. Uh, I've been in London. I mean, I've been all around the world um, in the last 20 years or so, but in, in London recently. And uh, I think like a lot of people, lockdown has helped to put things into perspective a little bit because it's been quite brutal over here. I think you guys in Japan have got off quite lightly um, comparatively. And it just kind of made me reassess. And I realized I wanted more more space and um, some more, more greenery. And because uh, I work from home, I you know, one of the things that I put a premium on was the, just to have a big office space. And, you know, I've got a garage here that I want to turn into a gym and, you know, garden where I can just walk around in. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was your kind of classic midlife relocation to the countryside. I think Midlife. You, you don't look that old to me. No, I'm going to be 40 this year, believe you. Oh, not. really? Um, wow. Yeah. But I don't, I feel 21. So there you go. Yeah, same here, you know, um, so 46 this year. So um, in, in in the same category. So, uh, yeah, Devon, beautiful part of the world. Um, one of the sunnier places in England. Yeah, it's certainly uh, uh, during the times when it's not raining. Well, today, you know, it's the sun is nice streaming today, yeah. in through the window. <laughs> you think it's like, oh, wow, it's always like that. But <laughs> yeah, no, not unfortunately not. Um, so great. So just a little bit about. Ali, um, can you tell me a little bit about your company URL and? Sure, yeah. So, I run a a, a business called I will teach you a language dot com. Although, depending on when people are listening to it to this, it, will, it could well be storylearning dot com because we're actually in the middle of a of a change, um, and that kind of gives you a, a hint at what we do. So, I teach languages through story, and that involves um, online courses, a very large range of published books which are in uh, available in fine bookstores everywhere uh, even in japan even in i've seen them in see them in tokyo uh yeah although usually in the foreign dictionary section which is kind of weird but but yeah so books of short stories books of um uh, of uh, things like that and yeah everything we do is based on teaching um, languages through stories in in different ways okay and just to to go back uh, just looking at your bio, I was looking at Amazon and you sent me a little bit through. So it, it all started when you were 19. Before that, you 
you did you said you didn't have a talent for languages or weren't too bothered about learning them so what was the moment that kind of took you to yeah learning very, languages? very 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 much so i um i grew up in you know in 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 the countryside in the uk typical monolingual life didn't know what a foreign language was um, but i moved to london when i was um university age and during my after my first year there i actually took a job in a cafe and i was working with people from all over the world italy france sweden and this kind of opened my eyes to the fact that there are there's a big wide world out there of um, people of places and people and cultures that are quite different from 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 english culture and i found it very appealing and i didn't like the fact that everyone else had to learn english to speak with me and often spoke each other's languages as well so i thought hey you know what i could learn their languages why, why don't i try that and so that kind of piqued the interest and then around the same time my, my girlfriend of two years decided to walk out on me and um that kind of sent me into a bit of a tailspin which culminated in me buying a one-way ticket on the Eurostar to go and live in Paris for six months where I learned French. And that was the, the beginning because I, 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 I was, I was fairly successful at learning French and that gave me the confidence then to go on and learn other languages, which is kind of what started my language learning journey. And I've learned uh, over 10 languages now um, to very varying, varying degrees. And so I've kind of been, um, very fortunate to live a life that's full of language and, and travel and uh, but it all started back there in those dark days of uh, pain and breakup in, in london wow there's uh, an origin story for you it's it's, uh, it's a bit like sliding doors or or some mo movie like that but, you know <laughs> they um yeah yeah it, it it happens um so yeah you you decided there was there wasn't much to live for in london and you said, okay, I want to try something new, go to Paris. You were 19 at the time? Yeah, pretty young. Yeah. I mean, 19 is the kind of age where you can get away with just disappearing because uh, you have no commitments really. And I, it just so happened that I'd, I'd taken a year off university, which was a kind of crazy decision, really. It was actually for other reasons, but it just gave me the flexibility to say, you know, sod this, I'm, I, I'm going somewhere else. And, and so I did. And so how was your level of French before you left? Oh, I mean, effectively zero. I'd done a little bit, a little bit at school, but you know what school French is like. Um, and so I couldn't do much when I arrived. So I was, yeah, starting from scratch. Mm. And you, you bought a one-way ticket. I did. I bought a one-way ticket. I had um, a contact there, someone I could stay with, who I kind of bunked, bunked with for, for a few weeks. And then I moved into a youth hostel and I was sort of stuck in the middle of uh, the, the Quartier Latin in, in Paris <clears throat> and um, in, a, in a youth hostel. <laughs> I just got a, got a job one day. The owner of the youth hostel that I was staying at said, hey, are you staying? And I was like, yeah. Do you, do you want to work in, an, in, a, in another youth hostel? And I said, yeah, sure. And so I found myself actually working, uh, working a regular job, working night shifts in a youth hostel in Paris, which was really, uh, I wouldn't do it again, but it was a good experience. How much French did you need for that? I mean, English would have been a big. Yeah, it was one. So it was one of those interesting things where the the job, the actual ins and outs of the job, I could get by in English because a lot of the people traveling there were um, international, so they spoke English. Uh, but the guy who hired me said, "You know, you know, do you speak French?" And I said, "Yes," because um, <laughs> I knew I wouldn't get the job otherwise. And then I had a lot of. French things happening. So people, French people would walk in off the street, French people would call, my boss would speak French. And so I just, but it's just like, you know, that kind of attitude when you're 19 and you just don't care, you just find a way somehow to do it. And so I just had this real kind of um, real, just strong headed approach to thinking, okay, I'm going to learn this. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do it. And, uh, and so it kind of just, I just threw myself right in at the deep end, which is uh, an interesting strategy. But I think because of my commitment and dedication to learning it, it worked out in the end. And when you said you, you went straight in, you you just started practicing straight away. Yeah, I mean, I, I, had, I, bought, yeah. I bought textbooks. I sat and studied in my in my free time, tried to memorize words, um, you know, listen, listening to things I found on the street. I mean, I had no concept of a method at that point. It was just, 
you know, learn. And so I, you know, doing the exercises in grammar books and I made little flashcards to try and remember my verbs. Um, so it was a fairly, fairly inept method, but, you know, I always like to say that the, the method is less important than your attitude. And um, because the method, you can figure it out as you go along, which is exactly what I did, but it was the attitude that gave me the, you know, the, the kind of wherewithal to actually take on that challenge. Okay. And, and what is that attitude? How would you describe it? it it's this, I'm going to learn this at all costs if it kills me. That's it, basically. Where did that come from? Was that your upbringing or was it just the situation that you were in or was it? Yeah, I don't know. No way I mean, back. Or... I, I actually tend to approach most things in life like this. You know, if I decide to get fit or if I decide to start a business or I decide to go and teach English in Japan or move to Brazil, it's all things that I've done. I tend to be quite absolutist about things. And I think I've always had this, this can do attitude. And I don't know where it comes from really. Um, but I've always been aware that I've had it and I haven't been scared to take risks um, in the kind of personal sense. And, and I think I've always kind of leaned into that aspect of, of my, of my personality. And it's, um, it's, it's, it's been good for me, I think. So when you say can do attitude, do do attitude, you just do it basically. There's no, I just, I just do it and I figure mm. out how to do it along the way. And um, you know, this is most relevant to business as well, because, because, because there's no right way to do business at all. You can learn. And, you know, it's amazing the number of people who say, oh, I went to business school, or I did a marketing degree, but I didn't learn anything. I learned everything in the real world. And I'm a big believer in just going out there, getting stuck in and making mistakes because the number one reason people never achieve anything is because they just don't get started or stick to it. And that goes as much for language learning as it does for, for business and, and anything else. Um, for that matter. So I think, you know, there's no reason that you have to learn how to do something. You know, our education system is built on the idea that you learn how to do something in advance and then you go and apply it. But I prefer the approach of applying it and then learning it at the same time. And, and you know, if you make mistakes, well, that's all part of the, of the learning process. Better to make a, a mistake in the doing of the thing than in the in the thinking about the thing. Mm-hmm. Seems a, a little bit like a... a- Maybe you were, is it Rick, Ricard, Richard, Ricardo, Semler? Is it Richard Semler? He's, uh, I think he, he is a company. But basically, he's famous for a few TED Talks. One of the TED Talks was he allows his uh, employees to set their own salary. And another <laughs> one, yeah, I know, it's kind of crazy. It, it's really interesting, actually, what, what he talks about. I can't really remember now. But another one he, he, he talks about is his attitude to learning is, uh, I think he's, he is an engineering background and he said, uh, you know, to build a motorbike, what do you do? You go the first day and say, no, you have to build a motorbike in three months. So people have to come together to form a team. They have to learn, you know, all the flow dynamics, aerodynamics, uh, y- you name it. So, you know, they're not learning the theory first. They have to put it into practice and then, you know, up, get some get get the theory to yeah. back it up so very very similar to your way of thinking is you go in you do it oh my god i i have a customer service issue I, maybe I'll, I'll research that i'll ask somebody else or something so that's it you know it's it's yeah i mean i i, I mean i would i would say that i'm also a very keen learner so i do learn a hell of a lot it's just that i don't i don't tend to learn and then wait i, I tend to learn and do at the same time so yeah, that, that I mean, it's not for everybody. A lot of people, I, I know, can experience anxiety in those kind of situations. Um, I quite like being thrown in at the deep end, having to speak to someone in a foreign language, um, even though it's not what I teach actually. But I quite enjoy it personally. But that can be very anxiety-inducing for for people for different kinds of people. So it's definitely not for everybody. But that that's just for better or for worse how I've done things. Mm. Yeah, so it's not for everybody. I think most of us have felt a little bit of anxiety at one time, especially when we don't know the answer and we're maybe in a crowded place and people are listening. Um, yeah, sure. So, so your your attitude, this is kind of bridges the gap between the the language learning and the the entrepreneurship. That your your attitude is you your how would we say your relationship with fear and anxiety because for some people you know they can be anxious you know public speaking you know launching a business so 
can you give some some advice on you know fear anxiety yeah i i actually i actually do experience a lot of fear and anxiety it's just with different things so some things i think there are certain things in my life that i'm that I'm very kind of gung-ho about and other things I'm very conservative about. So for example, with personal finance, I'm extremely conservative and I can experience anxiety around, um, around money issues of different kinds. Um, because I think that, that that's just something which I am quite attuned to for, for whatever reason. So in terms of personal finance, for example, I'm, I'm, quite conservative and, and can worry a lot about that. But when it comes to business finance, I'm extremely uh, pro risk and, um, and quite aggressive in that, in that sense. I, I'm very quick to invest in things that I, that I, that I see opportunity in. Um, so I, I think that the, the, there's a lot of misconceptions around starting a business. The kind of folklore of starting a business is that, Hey, it's this big risky thing which could crash and burn and destroy your life savings, put you into debt and make you bankrupt if it goes wrong. But that only holds true if you need to borrow a million dollars to start a business, for example. Whereas the, with the internet, you can start a business with nothing and start and take this approach to, 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 to building a business, which is a bit like climbing a mountain. You, know, you, just, you, put, your, <laughs> you put your foot on the, on the, on the first rock and then you, then the second, then the third, and then you just kind of go up from there. And in that sense, it's a bit like language learning. So I, you know, I, I've built my, my company the way that I learn languages, which is just, you, you know, I, I began my business one day in a coffee shop in Doha, which is the capital of Qatar, where I used to live. And uh, I, I, I read about a guy who had, had a language blog and I thought, Hey, I can do that. So I went on the internet, started a free WordPress blog, wrote my first blog post. And that was the beginning. And I wrote the second and the third and the fourth. And then eventually I learned to, 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 to create books and build products and sell them. Everything was one step at a time. So I, there was never really, I've never felt any risk particularly. And so I, there's, there's been no particular fear. The kind of fear that I've, that I have more than anything as the business has grown has been more along the lines of, well, what happens if this all crumbles down to the ground? Cause then there's a lot to lose. Uh, so I, I think I, I probably fear have more fear around loss than I do around the prospect of, of of gain, which is a pretty established psychological phenomenon as well. You know, loss aversion is more powerful than, than the prospect of gaining something. Uh, so I think for people who do experience fear or anxiety around something like starting a business, the first thing to think about is what well, is this justified? Because you know, would you still have that fear if I told you you could get started today for free, and then? then the only thing you have to lose is your time and your hard work. So everything really depends on the frame you, and the frame that you, that you give it and the lens that you look through. Okay. Yeah. Uh, excellent answer. And you anticipated where I was going next with, mm. we want to kind of go back to you, you'd finished um, working in the hostel and then we'll, we'll kind of fast forward a little bit to uh, Doha. So yes where did the idea for your business come about and how did it start? Yeah. So it was very simple. So I, you know, I spent a, um, a few years teaching English and that kind of led me to Japan and then to Qatar and then later to Egypt. But, and I, I did went the usual teaching route. Um, so I did my Delta and I went on to do a master's in teaching and eventually I moved into, into management. And at that point I, I felt a real lack of creativity because I'm a very creative person and I missed that. Um, in, in, in among the kind of desk duties of, the, of, a, of a middle manager, it was, I didn't enjoy it. And so I, I was always looking for a creative outlet and languages has always, had always been my, you know, my passion. And so it was just one random day when I was reading a book called the hundred dollar startup by Chris Gillibo. And he mentioned a guy called Benny who had a blog and he was traveling the world, paying his way through his blog. And, uh, and, and, so I went, I looked at his blog called Fluent in Three Months. I had a look at it and I thought, well, I can do that. And, it, and, it, and I just did. And it was as simple as that. It would happen one day. I was sitting in a cafe on a Saturday afternoon and just started the blog. And um, I think because I could see that there were, it had, that the idea had legs and it was possible to earn a living doing that, even though I didn't understand the ins and outs of it yet, I, could, I knew that it was possible because there was proof of someone who was doing it. 
because I, I, I could fixate on that outcome. Granted, I didn't know how to get there, but that was okay because I could then all I had to do was figure out how to cross the bridge the gap between where I was then to where I wanted to get to, which I eventually managed managed to do. Okay, so you mentioned Benny Lewis. He's quite well known internet yeah. polyglot, if, and uh, so you said he can do it. I can do it. Uh, how did you think you would position your your offering different to differently to to him? Yeah, good question. Because the first thing we always get told on the online space is you have to have a unique, um, a, new, a unique angle, a unique a USP. You don't like, have a me I too no company, way. isn't it? Not what they say. You're right. But, yeah. You don't. You don't want it to do whatever someone else is doing. And the truth is, it took me years to figure it out. Um, and I've I actually really struggled to differentiate myself because I, you know, I read all the, like right from the from day one, I read all the advice about finding your unique thing, and I thought, well, what can I do that's different? I don't know, and. and and, um, and, and so I, for years, I just, um, I, I just made it all about me. I thought the only unique thing really that I can offer here is me and my experience, which is kind of why I, I called it, I will teach you a language, which I think is a terrible name, but it's the best I could do at the time. Well, it says what it is. It says what it is, but it, yeah. see what, what, what I unwittingly did was create a personal brand. And I didn't know what a personal brand was, was at the time, but you know, one of the, one of the ways to differentiate yourself online is with a personal brand because every person is unique. And as learners, we, we resonate with our teachers. So what I was unwittingly doing was positioning myself as the teacher, as the, um, as the kind of the thought leader, if you like. And although I didn't have a, a unique angle to my method, I had the uniqueness of Ollie, which is enough to get started. Now, over time, I kind of outgrew that uh, because it's great to have a personal brand, but then you have to be able to say what your what you do differently. So, so I can say, "Hi, I'm Ollie. I teach languages." Yeah, that's not enough by itself. And so, eventually, I I started to gravitate towards the idea of learning through story, which I realized I'd done all along. I just hadn't really understood it in that way. And so, I I started to mold this into a into a tangible concept: learning languages through story. And then, so that kind of ended up becoming, "Hi, I'm Ollie. I teach." Um, I teach you how to learn languages quickly through story. And then that in itself, then story ended up becoming more important than Ollie eventually. So now the the business is all about learning through stories and, you know, my books and my courses kind of stand on their own two legs. So like, yes, I'm a part of that, but a dwindling part. And that's good for me because it means I can take a bit of a back seat because it's been quite some time now that I haven't been able to manage everything by myself. And you know, we have a, a team of more than 10 people who who run the business and um, I'm not really a central part in that anymore. Okay. And you mentioned uh, the $100 startup. And of course we, we talked a little bit about, you know, you, you like learning and learning from where do you learn from books, from courses, mentors? Tell me a little bit about that. A bit of everything is the answer. So you're, you're asking specifically about, about business. Uh, business. Yeah. Yeah. So I learned a lot of my initial stuff from podcasts. So I would go to the gym and I'd listen to podcasts about uh, starting your own online business. And I got a lot of my early education from that. And a lot, a lot of the kind of key messages were, were communicated very well in those, in those podcasts. So things like um, the concept of content creation and the idea of generating traffic through content and the importance of consistency in content, the importance of building an email list and communicating regularly with your audience. These are all kind of online business fundamentals. And those were really drilled into me early on by the podcasts that I was um, listening to. Books are of limited help here because the trouble is that information changes so quickly. If you take a year to write a book and then another year to publish it, it's out of date by that, by that point. So books are, are, are of limited value um, when it comes to the actual execution of these things. So podcasts are great because they're they're kind of very dynamic. Um, I also followed a lot of blogs and um, invested a lot of money in courses. So people, I would take courses about you know how to start a blog and then later how to create your first product and then how to automate it and how to grow and how to do marketing. And I've invested huge amounts of money in um, in learning online business. And that's one of the key things that I think I've done. I haven't been. I've always kind of taken the approach of, look, if I want to learn this stuff, why am I trying to get it all for free? Why don't I just go to the people who teach this stuff, pay them and learn what has to be learned? Uh, and 
and that's worked out very well because what I what I again what I learned from that without knowing it what, you know what I can articulate now that I didn't know at the time but actually unknowingly did was it's the idea of of speed because money is attracted to speed this is a, a Dan Kennedy concept which is uh, extremely important and a lot of people the kind of default for a lot of people learning online business is to try to learn everything for free take their time don't spend any money you know bootstrap it but actually it's far more valuable for you to pay a certain amount of money to learn from somebody and save yourself six months to 12 months of messing about figuring it out for yourself. You learn the lessons that need to be learned right now, and that buys you time and you pick up speed and momentum that way. And so then everything you learn kind of compounds. And so when I, when I look at, you know, colleagues of mine or, or um, contemporaries of mine who kind of started around the same time, one of the big reasons I think that, that, that differentiates uh, people who have um, developed quickly in their businesses as composed as compared to those who haven't is that those who've been willing to invest in learning have, have progressed so much quicker um, than others. And that, so that's partly why I, I so I, I actually have a, a kind of sister business called Langpreneur where I, um, where I together with my colleague, Jan, we, we, um, we help creators build online businesses around their, um, their expertise and one of the reasons that I decided to do that was because I learned so much myself from investing in good quality teaching that I wanted to, to, to offer that back to people and, and offer the kind of stuff that I've been learning myself and um, to others so that they can, they can make fast progress too. Mm. Okay. So mon- money well spent, uh, leverage other people's expertise and, learn as quickly as possible outsource things that are maybe too technical take too too long to learn and maybe don't like doing anyway is something like that I mean, yeah well outsourcing is kind of a different thing I, I i did everything myself for a long time i think a lot of people do at the beginning um the outsourcing for me was a, was a much slower process but i think the key you know the, if i were, if i were to go back and do it all again the thing that I would make sure to do is invest as much as possible in my own education from the start. And if I was getting started today, I'd do exactly the same thing because, because I mean, you can go slow and take your time for sure, but it takes a long time to build a business. I mean, my, my business is seven or eight years old now. And, um, and, and I, and I know what I'm going to be spending the next five, 10 years on. I can see, where that's going to go. It's a lifetime's work really. And the, the, just like language is the reason that most people won't succeed is just because they give up before they hit traction. So I think just like with languages, you want to get traction as soon as possible. And so in business terms, that means paying you earning enough money to, to live from. That should be really the goal of, of any new businesses. So how can you get to, to a kind of basic level of profitability, which so that you can then free up your time by quitting your regular job and then devote all your energy into the business. Like that's the kind of one of the big milestones in, in starting a business. And the, by far the quickest, you, you can get there quite quickly, you know, uh, but, but you do need to know, you do need to have a roadmap to follow. And, and if you try and figure it out yourself, you'll waste huge amounts of time on the wrong things. Okay. And um, what did you waste a lot of time on that you wish you hadn't? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, because I did invest in my learning, I don't think I did waste a, a huge amount of time. Um, but I think I would, the thing that I did very well was the basics and that is content, consistent content creation, because what you get from consistent content creation is you build an audience. And once you have an audience, then you have your business because you can create products and services for them. So the thing that I did very well even though it took time, you know, so for the first, I, I, I did nothing but blog for the first year. So for one year, I, I, I just wrote a blog post a week. And then after one year, I created my first product. And so I, but I didn't have a, a really a kind of functioning business. I wasn't in a position that I could quit my job until after a couple of years. And so I don't know if that's fast or slow. I think it's probably quite common, a fairly standard pace, um, in, for someone who's learning online business from scratch. And so I don't really think I wasted my time because, because the big thing I did was start to build my audience because that's what gave, that's what kind of created, 
created the business. Because in, in online business, you've got two ways of going, right? You can start with a product or you can start with an audience. And if you start with a product, you have your business up and running much faster because you've got something to sell, but you're in the difficult position of not having anyone to sell it to. So then you've got to go and find people to, to buy your thing. The other way of starting with the audience first, which is what I did and what I always recommend people to do because it's just an easier way to start, is that you, you, you build your audience and then you can get to know them by having an email list, communicating with them, asking questions, surveying them, um, interacting with them in the comments, things like that. You get to know what their pain points are and then that, that can become the, <clears throat> the business that you generate. You, know, you get to know who your audience is, what they need, and then your business is then helping them do that thing. So the, to the, the, the one thing that you can do to accelerate that process is to make sure that you're focused in, a, in, in terms of topic. So in my case, that was actually a disadvantage because I was just a kind of general language learning guy. <laughs> hey, I'll help you learn a new language. So people on my list were learning Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, French, Swahili. Uh, so it was quite difficult for me to service all of those different um, areas. So what I would advise someone getting started is to be very focused. So don't just talk about language learning, talk about learning Spanish, for example, or learning Japanese, because then everyone that you, the entire audience that you build is going to be learning that one language, which is going to then lead to a very clear and defined product line that you can create off the back of that. You just have to help them learn Japanese. And, that's, and then you can expand later from that if, if you want to. So the, the thing that took me longer, the thing that slowed me down in the beginning was not being focused in terms of a single language. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to blog about my passion, which was language learning. I didn't want to be a Spanish teacher or a Japanese teacher. I wanted to just blog about language learning. So that did make things slower for me, but it ultimately I think ended up being an advantage because, because now that we have such a large audience learning different languages, we can create all these different courses for them. And so that's what actually gives the business its scale, but it was a difficult way of going about it. <laughs> So you you started off and you think that you, you may be too general, as you say, you were you're trying yeah. to to cater to too many different audiences. So you brought up something really interesting there, which I'd like to explore a little bit more about mm. choosing an audience, because that's yeah. the one thing is, you know, cutting off all these other options. And the other is sometimes audiences are not profitable. I mean, it's not the right audience, yeah. not not the right time. How how do you know what's what's a what's a good way to to check that so there's a kind of um <clears throat> it it depends on whether you are to coming at this from a very general business perspective it depends on the market right so if there's the one answer to this is in any market how do you check the, the the profitability of any market or the viability of any any market you know from like lawn care treatments to you know hair products or whatever but um would it be fair to say that your audience is in the language learning space uh, my audience, I, I think, would be mostly English language teachers and directors okay. of study, so, university teachers, that sort of. Yeah. So in that sense, then your market is is the ESL market, right, or the EFL market. And you know, it's fairly evident that that is an established market with plenty of um, of earning potential. So I mean, that's enough. You know, if you're in the EFL <clears throat> market, then there is that's a viable market. There's no question. Um, the, the, what the challenge then is, is, well, in the sea of competition, how do you stand out? So once you've, and the same goes for me in, in the general language. I mean, I teach Spanish, I teach Japanese, I teach French, I teach Chinese. These are all clearly proven markets. So the, 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 more, the, more, the more important challenge is how do you stand out within, within that market? Now, if you came to me and said, like, Ollie, is there a market for... Um, for uh, rose scented candles. I have no idea. That would be a different question. Then we'd have to do basic, you know, basic market research, which you can do by looking at the, the performance of different product lines on Amazon, for example, seeing what people are actually spending money on. But in the language market, people do spend money. It's a huge market. You know, it's a, it's a, I don't know how many billions of billions of dollars it is, but it, it, but it's huge. So there's no question that the market's there. The challenge is standing out. Okay, so the, there's a couple of things there. So the first one was doing your market research. So for somebody looking to start out or are in business at the moment, you mentioned Amazon. 
is, yeah. is one place. What what's the demand for a particular product on Amazon? Is there any other cheap or uh, free way of doing market research? I mean, the, so the reason that Amazon often comes up in questions of market research is because it's the world's biggest marketplace, where, where and people go to Amazon just to buy things. They don't go to look around or to read articles. They go to buy stuff, right? So let's say we're in we're we're we're, we're thinking about starting a, a business for rose scented candles. If you go to Amazon and you see that there are a hundred different varieties of rose scented candles, and they have thousands of reviews, what you know from that is that large numbers of people are buying rose scented candles and that is enough to to validate that the market you know it's big enough um if on the other hand you went there and there were like maybe two or three different rose scented candles there and a couple of reviews on each and just not much activity that's not a good sign because it means in in, a, in the world's biggest marketplace no one is selling rose scented candles so that is a very good first first um first port of call and if you if you if you're kind of getting into very you know because some of the biggest products out there are very niche things you know, like dog kennels or uh you know um jet ski safety devices i don't, I don't know there's like so many different products out there and so it's not always obvious unless you have specific market knowledge whether something is a business or not um so so yeah, I mean, after that, what you would want to do is just to do to do a lot of basic searching on different marketplaces. So like you know, Google Shopping, um, maybe look on things like Alibaba potentially. Um, are people selling these things on eBay or Craigslist or whatever? You want to look around in the places where people are buying and selling things and seeing whether that thing that you plan to sell is being is there's a lot of activity there. Hmm. And forums as well, what, what people are talking, you know, what they're saying about products and what they're unhappy with and what the problems are. Is, would that be a good place? Yeah, I mean, again, it, that, what that would show you is that there are people who are buying it and the fact that they're talking about it shows that they're buying it. But that's, that, that's probably a different level of research. So the first, the first step would be to say, right, is, is, this, is this actually a market? Can I start a business making rose-scented candles? Assuming the answer is yes, then the next question is, right, well, how do I stand out from the crowd? That's when you might want to go to forums and say, and, and look at what do people like and dislike about rose scented candles? And then you can see, okay, well, actually, you know, I've looked at all these reviews in these forums, and it turns out that the, th the thing that everybody hates about their rose scented candles is that they burn too quickly. So what I'm going to do is make a rose scented candle that burns super slow and lasts forever. And so my, and then that could lead you potentially to a niche, which could be, the rose scented candle that lasts forever. And then you, based on market research, you've come up with an idea for something which is, um, which is, which, which can differentiate you from everyone else. Mm. And don't, uh, one thing that, that, you know, angel investors and uh, venture capitalists, they hear all the time is the person goes and said, oh, there's 10 million rose scented candles sold every year. If we get 1% of that market, we'll be, yeah. we'll be happy. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that works in big markets where you can actually do that kind of market analysis, right? So if, you, if you're thinking about starting a new type of car or you want to get into, or you want to get into the, um, the, the the insurance industry you know there for these industries you have readily available data um and so what you would and this is not my area of expertise at all but my understanding is what you would do is you say right here is a 10 billion dollar market and if we can get where we aim to get five percent of that market and the reason we think we can do that is because because you have to know how you're going to do that right and that's where the differentiation comes in so for example tesla might have looked at the car market and say you know what i think we can make a, a battery powered car and take five percent of the of the car market of the automotive industry and the reason we can do that is because we can make an electric car faster than everybody else and that's the differentiator right um i think that's only going to be worth doing in very large industries. For most people, what you're going to be looking at is what most people's aim is, is to start a, a, a healthy, profitable home business, which gives you a, um, an, a an appealing lifestyle, passive income, and it can be genuinely life life changing without without having to take in millions of dollars of investment to corner the car market. You know? So, in that sense, that kind of market research is, is probably not practical because you don't need to um 
to claim X percent of the length of any market in order to make a very good living for yourself. So, yeah. Okay. You, you, you brought up something uh, interesting there. You said about uh, positioning. Now, when people hear positioning, they think maybe brand differentiation, maybe price or, but, but you, you seem, you, you talk about positioning being your product solving a problem that another product is not solving or your service. Yeah. Yeah. That's how yeah. you would see it. That, that's how I tend to look at it. Just because, so your, your most powerful, um, your biggest growth will always come from having it will always be led by the product. So if you've got a quality product, word gets round. People will talk about it in Reddit. They will post reviews on Amazon. They will recommend it to their friends. So I always think that, that if you um, can create a product that people like more than all the others, that's your best ever referral marketing mechanism. So you need to start with that because other, I mean, think of, think of the, think of what, how it would be if that were not the case, right? So if you didn't have anything that's unique, if your rose scented candle did nothing different from the other 100 rose scented candles on Amazon, then why, then, then that means that the, the only game you can play is to outmarket your, uh, your competitors, right? Because there's nothing special about your product. So no one's going to talk about it. No one's going to, recommend it to their friends, which means you're then fully responsible for, for marketing it more than anybody else. Um, but if you, but you can do that job for them um, and, and make it easy for them by having a product that everybody likes more than everything else. Okay. And just to recap, we're talking to Ollie Richards from teach me a language.com. Is that right? I, I will I teach you a language. Dot, I, I will, will teach, teach you a language. language. Yeah. There you go. And, but most likely story learning.com by the time uh, people listen to this story, story learning.com. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to go back about a few points you made there. And before talking to Paul Salloway a few weeks ago, and Paul uh, went in a lot about uh, landing pages and marketing. So um, mm. what, what you say is right. It's, it's really good advice get a mailing list first. Yes. Yeah. Get a mailing list. Somebody, I, I think I, I, I listened to these podcasts like you and one guy was asked, what's your biggest regret? And he said, just get a mailing list. He said he had a business for four years, five years, and he had no mailing list. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's the main thing. And I mean, build a, build, build a mailing list is it would be more appropriate because, because uh, a, a mailing list is built one person at a time. So it's not some it's not it's not something that you acquire. I mean, you can acquire a mailing. You can buy a mailing list from from people, uh, but I wouldn't advise it. Uh, mailing list is built, and what a mailing list is is just is it's what the mailing list gives you is the ability to contact people on demand. Because if you don't have a mailing list, then you actually have no way of contacting your customers other than doing things like updates on social media that most people won't see, and they're not paying attention anyway when they're on Instagram. Um, so yeah, the mailing list is is a really really big thing. And it's, but it's, but it's built gradually over time. Okay. And it, it's all part of the process of building the trust and the likability and building excellent products. Exactly. Yeah. That people have. So the second thing was quality. This is from a number of entrepreneurs we've, we've spoken to over the past few weeks is that, and, and uh, maybe I'll put this into a kind of cliff notes version or put it in a post or some kind of key nugget takeaways from people. Another thing people are talking about is just have a great product. So tell me about your great product. How, how do you make it great? What's... Yeah, well, assuming it is great. I mean, it might not be, but uh, people, people, <laughs> people seem to like it. So we, we have a lot of different um, products. Probably our most well-known products at this point are our books of short stories, which are, um, and that's been helped. So I, 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 I publish my books with, uh, with teach yourself, which is a well-known, um, language publisher. And what they've brought to the table is they've helped us to get into bookshops um, around the world. So, um, the, we've sold hundreds of thousands of, of these books and that's done wonders for kind of getting the idea of learning through story, um, out there and it's really helped to, to grow the business and most people are although we have a big digital product business it's those it's the books which actually people share most on instagram and give to their friends and buy christmas presents and things like that so um 
I, I know I've been self-publishing books for, for years, but one of the, you know, since you asked about quality, working with Teach Yourself has been a fantastic experience because they've been able to kind of bring in the whole apparatus of a major international publisher um, to the equation. And so what, what that's done is it's layered on top many different things. So we've got multiple layers of editors, everything from copy editors to developmental editors to commissioning editors and, you know, world-class designers and typesetters and, and, and things like that, along with multiple rounds of proofreading, although you can never do enough proofreading. Um, when, I've, when we released the, uh, when we released the, uh, the our first round of, of, of six books a few years ago, I got my, my, my first proof copy of the German book, short stories in German for beginners. And I opened up the, the front cover and it said, uh, short stories in German for beginners. Uh, read at your level and learn Italian the fun way, which was a, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thing to see. So even the pros um, never can never do enough enough proofreading. But what that's done is um, is it's created a really quality product that people really like, and that that would have been difficult to do ourselves just f- for the cost involved mm-hmm. in having that number of professionals working on it, and not to mention getting it into bookshops as well. So. The reason I mention this is because here is a, a product that people really like and it's transformational for them. So I often get messages from people saying, you know, I've just read, Oli, I've just read your, your French book and I have, I, this has been an incredible experience because I've just realized I can read in French and I can enjoy it and I can understand it and I feel amazing. And so that kind of transformational experience then is a, a major breakthrough moment for people. And so because of that, guess you know, what do they do next? Well, they look on the back cover and they, and they see my website and they come to the website and they think, oh, this is interesting. I can continue learning through story with, with different courses at different levels. And so what do they do? They, they then try out one of the courses and then they give the, they, they give the gift the book to a friend who's just started learning French, who then goes through the same process. And if the product were not good, then that would never have happened. They would have picked up the book, flicked through it. It would be gathering dust on a shelf. Now I'm sure that some books are gathering dust on shelves um, in some places, Um, but it's the quality which starts the relationship um, and that that makes it so powerful. And obviously I I mean, I I try to do that across all of my products. We have similar reactions to our courses as well. Um, But the, the short story books are really the most kind of visceral example for me because they because they're more they're, they're the most wide widely disseminated um, products and the things which tend to spark the most emotion and joy in people. Okay, so tell me tell me a little bit about uh, starting out with with the, the books and and finding a publisher and deciding to go with uh, you've already outlined some of those reasons you know they have that infrastructure you can get into bookshops mm-hmm. and you you had done quite a bit of self publishing so um tell me about the transition from self publishing to working with another publisher what did you learn there working with yeah so i had probably seven or eight self-published books by that point. And then teachers have actually approached me um, because they'd seen that the books were, were doing well, that they had, uh, they, were, they really resonated with people. Um, and, and so teachers have approached, approached me and said, you know, would you consider partnering up with us? And that was the start of a kind of, of a long conversation. And there are pros and cons to that. For most people starting out, I probably wouldn't recommend going the traditional published route because um, it's a lot slower. You make a lot less money um, in royalties and um, it's, it's extremely difficult. You know, everybody for a lot of aspiring authors, you know, a, a publishing contract is their dream, you know, but it's extraordinarily hard to do. And because the pro, I mean, if you'd like, I could explain to you the process that a book goes through from conception to final approval from the, from the board of a publishing company. It's really hard. And at every opportunity, they, it can just get shut down and and discarded. So, it, so for most people, going the self published route is the by far the best way of doing it. Um, but in my case, what I really what what one of the things that teachers have brought to the table was the commitment to produce these books in lots of other languages. So, wh- whereas I think we had five or six languages at that point, you know, now we've got 25, 30 languages and at, at different levels as well. And that means I can just reach more people. And so people who buy our books in um, Swedish or Icelandic or Turkish, 
there's not much material in those languages in the first place. And so for them, it, it's, it's a really important production because, because for these less common languages, there just isn't that much material out there. So th that was the main reason that I decided to partner with Teach Yourself, because even though I actually gave up quite a lot of money in, um, in earnings from the self-published operation, I, I'm always, I always try to focus on long-term growth and long-term potential. Um, above other things. And that's luckily, you know, worked out really well. Hey, so I, I suppose we kind of got a bit of a head of ourselves. So I, I'd like to go more into the development of your company and the products that you developed and, and where you are now. So let's go right back to Doha. You, you started the company, you were saying you were working for two years and then you got a bit of traction. Tell me, tell me about that. Yeah. So I, like I said, I just did nothing but blogging for the first couple of years and it was a very, you know, some people, so they can say this kind of hockey stick growth where they just, everything just explodes. I never had that for me. It was long, slow grunt work, you know, consistently publishing every week. And, um, but after a couple of years of doing that, you know, that really adds up and starts to compound and then more people start talking about you. And so you create opportunities for serendipity and things like that. And so it really was a case of, sort of having faith in the process and sticking at the the consistent content creation for long enough for the um for the, for the traction to build and then eventually it does build and then um you know, i don't i don't really remember numbers at this point but i but i think i probably launched my first product once i had something like 20 20 20 or 30,000 hits a month to my website which is small but but it's something and um you know, I had a mailing list of about 2000 people. And so that was more than enough for me to launch my first product. And I didn't, you know, I made a couple of thousand dollars from it. It was, it was, it wasn't exactly life-changing, but it was uh, what a lot of people refer to as your first money event. So the first time you actually sell anything online is a big moment uh, because it gives you confidence and, 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 and the faith that you can, that you can keep doing it. So yeah, that's how it, that's, that's how it happened. And then everything else from there has just been the same thing. It's been steady, steady, slow, consistent growth. But, um, you know, with, with business, I think a lot of the time, if you can just keep going, then everyone else just drops away over time. And then you end up in a, in a, in a, in a stronger position, the longer you can keep it up. Mm. So you, you, you started, you stayed going just consistently get in front of the PC, put your, put your articles out every week, every month, whatever yeah. you, you, you were doing. And eventually you were building traction. You got people coming to the site. You built your first product. How did you scale from there? What? It was literally more of the same. So more content, more like same consistency, more consistency, in fact, and then just grew and grew and grew over time. So I think that one of the key things that that did start to help uh, facilitate that growth would have been um actually starting to outsource content creation so i at the beginning i would um write all the articles myself um but then eventually i hired uh, writers and um and content editors for the site who helped to then that which removed me from the process of actually writing writing content so so now you know at the moment we we publish three or four very high quality professional articles a week on the website and that starts to systematize the process of content creation uh, and when, you, when you're growing a business it's your systems which do it for you uh, and so you've got to move gradually towards having a system for everything and content creation because it's very labor intensive um, is one of those things which can really crush you if you insist on making all the content yourself. So I, I know for for EFL magazine, you have writers who contribute to your to your to your website, and that's that's a fantastic way of doing it because because then the business can continue to grow independently of you. Because any any young business faces the the, the bottle the the, the the faces the dilemma eventually of the owner becoming the bottleneck in the business where they are the only people who can make and produce stuff. And so you really, this is one of the key moments, you know, removing yourself as the bottleneck. So I managed to do that eventually with, by finding um, quality, high quality writers and content editors. And that really 
that allowed us to put out more content and then keep it consistent over time. So that just, it didn't give us that hockey stick growth at all, but it helped to just keep the foot on the gas. Mm. It, it, it reminds me actually of an interview, which uh, please go back if you haven't listened already to Dean Rogers here in Tokyo, who uh, what, what, what he said was that v- very similar is don't make the business about you. And this is Joe's business and Joe runs everything here. And if Joe and if, for example, you're trying to sell the business that uh, like, for example, Dean was talking about, you, you know, because he does a lot of take over purchases and uh, works with with a lot of companies it, so mm. if you go to uh, uh dean and you say oh my god i'm the linchpin in this business and then yeah. i'm taken out there's no business so yeah this depends on what you're aiming for right so there are different so if you are a business uh if, if you are into acquisitions or flipping businesses then yeah this is absolutely fundamental because you can't uh you know you, you need to have an exit strategy but that's not most people. I mean, for, if, if you are somebody who wants to build a cash flow business, so something that gives you um, and improves your lifestyle, then you're probably not looking for an exit. I mean, I, I've never built my business with an exit in mind because, I mean, why would I? I I'm lucky enough to do to do fairly well, and why would I ever want to, um, you know, give this up? And so I've um, even for something at the scale of, of what what we're doing, there's no need to, to sell the business. What's more, dif- what's more pressing and more likely to be a, um, a problem for you is the kind of, is the systems and operational bottleneck. So it's like, you know, you want to produce more content and YouTubers have a very hard time with, the, uh, with this because YouTubers are the face and they have to be there on camera talking. I'm the face of my business, but anybody can write the words that go on the blog. YouTubers have a particularly difficult time because they, and podcasters as well, for that matter, because you know, you, mm. you, you if you're not there in person, then it, then it can be tricky. Um, and so then you, you're faced with either you've got a choice, right? You can either bring in other people to produce content so you can focus on the business, or you can remain the focus on the content and then bring in other people to manage the business. Well, you got to take, you got to go down one, one of those two routes. And, you know, what I did for a long time, and I think this is probably pretty common, is I was doing a bit of both, right? So I was trying to ramp up the content myself whilst also trying to grow the business. And, um, and it's, it, uh, you know, that was, that had to change. Um, and in, and in, my, in my case, I kind of ended up um, getting other people, bringing on other people to create content so I could focus on the business. But actually, funnily enough, now I'm at a point where the business has grown so much that other people manage the business. And I actually go back to focusing on content because that's what I enjoy. So I'm growing a YouTube channel at the moment, um, which you can find at just search for Ollie Richards on, on YouTube. And I'm putting all of my. I had a look to today, YouTube. by the way. Yeah, your apps uh, that work. I had a I had a quick look at right. Uh, yeah, those four types of apps you were talking about on. on uh, yeah. So I, at the moment, I'm just you know we are whatever we are kind of February 2021 as as we speak, and I'm just experimenting like hell with with different types of YouTube videos. Um, but that's because I actually see that, you know, now that I have good people operating the business, that the, be- the biggest value that I can add actually is by, is by creating um, compelling content. And, you know, YouTube in particular, I think is a huge growth opportunity for the future. So, so, so that's why I've decided to spend more of my time doing that. So we kind of go in ebbs and flows and, and there may be a time in the future where I decide to sell. And at that point, um, you know, it would just be a case of going through that process of, the question you have to answer is how can you continue to grow your traffic and your audience with other people? That's the, but that's usually solvable in one way or another. It just might need a transition process. Mm. Okay. So for people starting out, maybe as entrepreneurs or other in this space, uh, where would you see an opportunity that you, you wouldn't chase yourself? You know, you're too busy, too many other things going on. Ooh, maybe that's an interesting question. somebody could look at. Well, I mean, that kind. The thing, the thing about that question is, it kind of implies that it's a zero sum game, but it's absolutely not the case because you know, you go on YouTube. How many thousands of English teachers are there on YouTube? Hmm. Um, you know, there's room for everybody. And the, the great thing about having, I mean, for most people, the answer is going to be in having a personal brand because a personal brand gives you immediate um, standout to everybody else. So you know, you and I could both start our own English teaching YouTube channel today. 
And some people would prefer to learn from you. Other people would, would prefer to learn from, from me. So uh, it, it's not a zero sum game. And, and I, I don't believe in the idea of competition in language learning because I think people, you know, one thing we know about language learners is they learn from lots of different people. When was the last time you found someone with one solitary language book in their, on their shelf? You know, they, they have dozens. So um, yeah. over here, <laughs> yeah, I have we, all, we all do. <laughs> we all, we all do. And, um, and so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about trying to be um, trying to find the one thing that nobody else is doing so that, because then you're always going to be kind of looking over your shoulder thinking, well, what is someone copy? Cause someone can always come and copy you. Right. The one thing that nobody can ever copy is you. So I think for most people who are just looking to, 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 to create a, a lifestyle business, then, you know, the, the biggest thing you can do is to create something with your personal brand. Okay. And uh, excellent advice there uh, about branding and personal branding. Uh, what's for the future for Ollie and I will teach you a language. Mm. Did I get it right this time? Yeah, that's hope, right. That's yeah, right. Yeah. I, I, well, yeah. So the, the good, so the, the, there's a lot. It would take me the rest of the, the rest of the day to explain everything, all the, all the plans that we have, but the, um, so as I've mentioned a couple of times already, so I will teach you a language becoming storylearning.com. And that's the, us kind of doubling down on the concept of learning through story. And so we've got a lot more courses coming out in different languages and different levels. Um, but one of the things that I'm moving slowly towards is to actually start to teach other subjects through story as well. So I'm not sure what those will be yet, but the idea of learning through story is pretty much, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a timeless idea and um, and so hopefully within the next couple of years, what you'll see is uh, us taking the concept of story learning and teaching other subjects. Okay, well. excellent. Wow, I, uh, I can't wait to uh, to see that. So, what's uh, what's a good way to follow you? You're uh, you're on LinkedIn, Twitter. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't Instagram. recommend. As we, <laughs> yeah, as we were as we were discussing earlier, I wouldn't necessarily recommend contact contacting me on LinkedIn because it might be it might be six months before I see the message. But uh, yeah, so the, the kind of home for everything is IWillTeachYouALanguage.com. You can find me on YouTube as well. Um, I have a podcast called the I Will Teach You A Language podcast. Uh, and you can um, you can email me, um, Ollie at IWillTeachYouALanguage.com or you can hit me up on Instagram at IWillTeachYouALanguage. I, I'm kind of every, I don't, I don't really do Twitter. Twitter is kind of not really my thing. Um, me neither. Yeah, I just mentioned this uh, in a, uh, a presentation I was giving last week is... Uh, Twitter, I just don't want to go there, basically. Yeah. Mm. I, I mean, I, I prefer doing things which are more evergreen. And I think mm. you tweet something out and it's gone off into the into the ether. So I, I prefer to focus my time on stuff that, that is evergreen, like this podcast, for example, or a YouTube video or, or blog content. Um, but yeah, if you want to get in touch, uh, email, Instagram, I'm, I'm pretty re responsive. So if you, uh, I, I'll, as long as I get the message, <laughs> I'll usually reply to you. Okay, great. And just to remind you, re remind the listeners of uh, your websites again and your books, the names. Yeah, so I will teach you a language dot com. And if you want to find my books, they're all on Amazon. So you can go to Amazon and search for Ollie Richards. I have uh, dozens of books in different languages, um, and uh, so you might like you might like what you found there. And uh, on YouTube, um, search for Ollie Richards and the I will teach you a language podcast available and find podcast players everywhere. And that's Ollie with a Y. I see. It says O double L Y O L L Y. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good point. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because sometimes people, I say, I always oh, say Philip, Philip with spellings. one L. Yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes it, it happens. So uh, I, when I worked in an office every day, you know, I ask clients to email. Say it's Philip with one L, and people were like, "Oh, it is Philip with one L." Yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> half half the time I, I actually get oil, um, dear oil, O I L, and I think that's probably autocorrect kicking in, but you know. I, I really think autocorrect has got has got worse over the past it's got few out of control, weeks. Hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, what's happening with autocorrect? It's uh, it's gone crazy today. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, Ollie, thank you very much for your time. And, thank you. It's been a great uh, to chat. It's been it's been a real pleasure. I learned a lot, and we hope the audience has has too. And see one last thing oh, I should mention, actually, since since since, since you asked, if, I mm. mean, for people listening who want to build a business, actually, that I mean, the, the best place to go um, to find more about me would be to langpreneur.com because at Langpreneur, we actually, we actually teach people how to build language based um, businesses. So 
silly of me to not mention that. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, please. This is this is the place to do it. Um, Ollie, thanks again. Thanks so much. Great to talk. Thanks for listening to the EFL Magazine Business Podcast with Philip Pound. For more great advice and resources, check out EFLMagazine.com. If you found this podcast helpful, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. See you next time.